Hi, it's Patrick Hutzel here from IntensiveCareHotline.com, where we instantly improve the lives for families of critically ill patients in intensive care so that you can make informed decision, decisions, get peace of mind, control, power, and influence fast. So today I want to uh, go live again uh, for our viewers and, and read, readers and clients. Everybody who has a love session is for, um, because if you have a loved one critically ill in intensive care, um, you have millions of questions. And often you don't even know what questions you have until you sort of dive a little bit deeper uh, into the uh, subject arena, because it's such a highly complicated and highly specialized area. Um, also, I take uh, live calls from you. I put some phone numbers into the chat pad uh, below this video or next to the video. You can call me live and we can discuss your questions live on, uh, on this show. Um, so, or you can type your questions in the chat pad. Doesn't matter to me one way or another, it's fine. As long as you're happy to pick up the phone. Uh, we can discuss live here on the show. Um, so I've done a few live videos before. I've done lots of webinars and talking to uh, people every day all over the world about their loved ones in intensive care. Um, I have worked in intensive care for over 20 years as a, as a critical care nurse uh, in three different countries. I have also worked uh, as a nurse unit manager in intensive care for over five years. So. I really know intensive care inside out and I know the subject matter really well. So um, whilst you are getting your questions ready and whilst you are either pick up the phone or send me a text in the chat pad, um, I want to talk today about induced coma and why patients are not waking up um, in a time frame that's sort of convenient for families in intensive care. They're very impatient. They think when their loved one is in an induced coma, they need to wake up quickly and it often doesn't happen. So let me go back one step uh, by just answering the first question uh, as part of this topic, which is really what is an induced coma and why would your loved one need to be in an induced coma? So an induced coma, generally speaking, is used for patients that are critically ill, but also for patients who end up on a ventilator with a breathing tube. And again, for somebody to get on a ventilator with a breathing tube, they are often critically ill uh, or they come out of surgery, they have breathing problems, they couldn't breathe on their own because their pain needs to be controlled and they're getting so much pain relief, for example, that they wouldn't be able to breathe by themselves, hence the induced coma. If you think about it, if you've ever seen a breathing tube, that's stuck into your throat, that's very painful. The pressures that go into your lung through a ventilator are very high. And again, that's very uncomfortable, very painful. And therefore, that's one of the reasons why your loved one needs to go into an induced coma. Other reasons are trauma, like, you know, after motor vehicle accidents, people falling off roofs, people having head injuries. Um, after any sort of trauma, an induced coma is generally being used as well to protect a critically ill patient uh, and most of the time simply to maintain their airway put a breathing tube in, put them on a ventilator so their airway is safe whilst they're critically ill. When patients are induced into a coma, um, it often triggers a series of drugs being used. Most um, probably common one and, and some people would have heard of it is propofol or diprovan. Uh, that's a sedative. It's a short-acting sedative. But on top of that, because it's so um, painful, um, when patients are getting on a breathing tube and a ventilator, other issues are uh, that pain needs to be controlled and therefore fentanyl or morphine are being used as well. And one of the main side effects of fentanyl or morphine is respiratory depression, which basically means that breathing is inhibited. Um, and that is counterproductive, especially when patients come out of an induced coma 
because they had a lot of morphine or fentanyl, which has as a main side effect uh, respiratory depression. And when you're waking somebody up and you want to wean them off the ventilator, you want to achieve the opposite. You want to get them off the ventilator as quickly as possible. Uh, and, and that can be difficult, especially if fentanyl and morphine have respiratory dep depression as the main side effect. Um, so now that we clarified what an induced coma is, you know, we want to look at time frames. You know, how long does it take for somebody to wake up after an induced coma? Well, the answer is really that it depends. It depends for how long somebody does need to be in an induced coma. And that really depends on the nature of their critical illness. Depends how well they can tolerate breathing tube and ventilator. You know, if somebody is having a sepsis, you know, they're often on a ventilator for many days. Uh, and again, generally speaking, the longer someone is on a ventilator, the longer it takes for them to wake up. Um, other issues are if your loved one is in an induced coma, for example, after a trauma, right, they've got fractures and they need surgery for the fractures, you know, they go to surgery while they're in intensive care. And again, they will then have more anesthetics while they're in surgery. They will have more, more of the strong pain relief, such as morphine or fentanyl. Again, that delays waking up because morphine or fentanyl, as well as uh, propofol or midazolam, also known as versed, are in the system, in the body system, and it takes time for that sometimes to uh, uh, get metabolized. Talking about sedatives, so as I mentioned, propofol or diprovan is a short-acting sedative. So that means if you're sedating somebody with propofol, and you switch off the propofol, they should wake up reasonably quickly within half an hour or so. Bear in mind, if there are also an opiates such as morphine or fentanyl, that again delays the process. If somebody needs an induced coma for much longer than just a few days, uh, often midazolam is used, midazolam also known as Versed. Midazolam is a benzodiazepine it's generally speaking a stronger sedative than propofol. It's long acting. So that means if you switch off propofol, uh, if you switch off midazolam or versed, it can take quite some time uh, for patients to wake up. Um, also, a benzodiazepine such as midazolam is also addictive in its nature. So that means if somebody is on high doses of midazolam, you may have to wean it gradually because of the addictive nature. Same with fentanyl and morphine, right? They are addictive in nature, which means if patients are on high doses of morphine, fentanyl, or midazolam, it needs to be weaned gradually uh, so patients do not withdraw uh, from it. Um, because what can happen during a critical illness and if patients are withdrawing from uh, drugs such as uh, morphine, fentanyl, or midazolam, if they withdraw, there could be other side effects, such as, you know, high heart rate, tachycardia, um, nightmares, uh, confusion, hallucinations, as well as other withdrawal symptoms that could reach uh, as far as potentially seizures. So that's why you have to take things gradually, uh, especially with addictive substances like midazolam, morphine, or fentanyl. Um, a newer sort of uh, drug on the market for sedation and pain relief for an induced coma is Presidex, uh, also known as dexmedetomidine. Uh, Presidex or dexmedetomidine is sort of the one size fits all, if you will. It's designed to uh, have a sedative effect as well as uh, have um, pain relief. Now, and, and it's, you know, if you are using Presidex or dexmedetomidine, in theory, you shouldn't need propofol, midazolam, or fentanyl, and uh, morphine. Again, it's a quote unquote one size fits all. Uh, from my experience, Presidex doesn't work very well. That's my experience. I'm not disputing if other people say different things. Uh, from my experience, it's, you know, nine times out of 10, it doesn't work well. Yes, it does have a sedative effect um, because of the clonidine, because there's clonidine in uh, Presidex. Um, but especially when it comes to severe pain, um, it doesn't seem to work well from my experience. Um, that leads me then to the next point, which is, you know, 
what does it mean when patients respond during an induced coma? You know, if they squeeze fingers, if they try to open their eyes, you know, and all of that. Well, that's a good sign, generally speaking. But it's all, often also, um, I do believe that families put too much weight on it. Um, you know, I, I guess you haven't seen your loved one in a situation like that before. But after I've looked after thousands of critically ill patients over the years, you know, if somebody's moving in an induced coma, they're trying to open their eyes, they twitch their eyes, they're squeezing hands, moving hands. You know, that's positive for sure, but it shouldn't be sort of, um, what's the word? You shouldn't put, put too much of a weight on it because it could just be a reflex. You know, where the rubber hits the road really is when patients are taken off sedation and then, you know, then you've got a gauge of how long it takes them to wake up. Then it's important to gauge are they following simple instructions like squeezing fingers and this, that and the other. So, you know, that's where the rubber hits the road when your loved one is waking up. Um, so then, obviously, the question that we always get every day in our intensivecarehotline.com consulting advocacy service is really how long does it take for somebody to wake up after an induced coma? Well, that's the million dollar question. And there is no simple answer to this. There is no simple answer to how long does it take to wake up after an induced coma. You now have a better idea that there's different sedatives, that there's also opiates. You know, it really depends on how much uh, sedatives and opiates your loved one had. It depends for how long, how many days, potentially weeks, right? So it's all dependent on that. It's also dependent if your loved one, for example, is in kidney failure or in liver failure. Um, you know, because that if they are in kidney or in liver failure, it takes a lot longer to uh, metabolize any of the medications. And if they can't be metabolized, they stay in the body system for much longer and um, waking up is delayed, right? I have seen patients uh, not waking up after an induced coma for days, sometimes for weeks, and you've got to be patient. Uh, sometimes patients do end up with a tracheostomy, um, you know, to enable them to wake up in their own time. And that's certainly the right thing to do as long as patients don't go to LTAC, also known as long-term acute care. Um, but that would be for a whole other discussion. And there's uh, tons of videos and articles out there from me about why your loved one should not go to LTAC if they do have a, a tracheostomy, if they do end up with a tracheostomy. Um, so if your loved one doesn't wake up, for example, after an induced coma, it's been two, three, maybe four days after sedation has been switched off, what needs to happen as a next step is definitely that um, your loved one um, needs to have a CT scan of the brain to rule out a stroke, to rule out any, any neurological event. Because, you know, the risk for somebody to stay in an induced coma is simply that neurological events go undetected. So, for example, if your loved one has a stroke while they're in an induced coma, that could be very detrimental and, and it could be a catastrophe, really. Um, so, yes, if your loved one isn't waking up after a few days, uh, then a CT scan of the brain needs to happen uh, and other potentially neurological tests need to follow, like an EEG, um, you know. Uh, there is also often delay if uh, your loved one has a brain or head injury. Um, and, and that's a whole separate topic. Waking up after head or brain injuries, again, is different compared to waking up after a general induced coma, right? So it's very important to... Um, uh, draw a line there and make a distinction and I will do a live video about head and brain injuries and waking up um, in the next few weeks. Um, so also if your loved one can't wake up, doesn't wake up, it also goes hand in hand with your loved one not being able to be weaned off the ventilator because again in order to be weaned off the ventilator and the breathing tube your loved one um, needs to um, breathe by themselves and they can't breathe by themselves can't make can't manage a safe airway can't maintain a safe airway i should say if they are too drowsy because the risk of vomiting aspiration is there and that 
is something that can't be managed uh, without a breathing tube then. It's too unsafe. So if that's the case, if your loved one can't be extubated, can't be weaned off the breathing tube and the ventilator, they do need a, a tracheostomy then to enable them to wean, uh, to wake up in their own time. Tracheostomies can be wonderful things. They can be horrible things. You know, they can keep a patient on the ventilator for, for, long, for a long time to come, which is certainly not what you want. But at the same time, it can keep your loved one on a ventilator at least until they're more awake, until they can be weaned off the ventilator in their own time. Uh, as long as it takes, you know, really for your loved one to wake up after an induced coma. Again, that can take time. Uh, other things that could uh, happen um, uh, during a uh, induced coma, if your loved one isn't waking up, right? For example, if they had too much morphine, right, you could give some um, Narcane, right? Um, so you can then, it's the antidote to morphine, and you can basically reverse the, um, uh, the effects of the morphine, right? The same for midazolam. If your loved one had too much midazolam, you can give some uh, flumazenil, uh, which is an antidote for um, benzodiazepines such as uh, midazolam, right? So it's important that you look at the situation from all angles, but it's also important that you um, don't panic and that you give your loved one time, right? Um, it's very important not to panic, and it's really important that you give your loved one the time they need to wake up. Um, so other issues during an induced coma are simply that, you know, your loved one is, is you know, is criti they are critically ill and they need time, but they also need, you know, they need some rest so that they can heal. But at the same time, at the same token, you know, as soon as your loved one uh, is sort of getting to the point where they are getting more awake, they also should start moving because uh, muscle wastage happens very quickly in ICU, deconditioning happens very quickly in ICU, often only takes a few days to get deconditioned, which then makes it harder to uh, get patients off the ventilator. You know, the deconditioning doesn't help. And also I should say, whilst your loved one is in a coma or in an induced coma and sedation has been stopped and um, they're still not waking up, you now other things that need to happen is physical therapy or physiotherapy to get them going get them out of bed potentially if they're not too weak. Yes, even if they're unconscious, they can sit in a chair or in a special chair just for ICU patients with a breathing tube. Um, you know, that helps them. Stimulation is important when your loved one is waking up. Nice, warm washers from the nurses, you know, body hygiene is very important. Uh, uh, washers, um, it, it all helps with stimulation. Uh, and a lot of TLC, tender loving care, you know, it's very, very important. It can't be underestimated uh, how important the basic nursing care is in a situation like that too. Um, so that's it really in a nutshell. I have written extensively about how long does it take to wake up after an induced coma, made some other videos about that that are even going into more in depth. Um, so that's it for today. Really, I, I noticed that nobody's had a question so, and that's okay. I'm sure you're just listening. You know, you can ring me on the numbers that I put in the chat pad anytime. You can also send me a direct message here on YouTube, or you can email me to support at intensivecarehotline.com. Uh, go and check out our case studies at intensivecarehotline.com under the Your Questions Answered section, and, um, and watch our quick tip videos. And if you need help from me directly, just give me a call on one of the numbers, or again, send me an email to support at intensivecarehotline.com. This is Patrick Hutzel from intensivecarehotline.com and I'll talk to you in a few days. Take care for now.